All right, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7 this morning, and I am really excited about this because I think this has the power to maybe set some folks uh, free from some of the stresses, some of the weights that have been in their lives. We talked a couple of weeks ago about not worrying. We t- talked a few weeks ago about not judging others. Uh, Jim last week challenged us to testify. And, and I think the prayer, the, the, the words that Jesus has for us this morning about making requests about prayer to God uh, is something that should be really, really exciting. So as we go to Matthew 7, let me ask you, if you can have a memory or an idea, maybe a feeling of what I'm talking about this morning, have you ever had a really big request that you were really nervous about making? Like you, you knew it wasn't, it wasn't just a like, take it or leave it, no big deal, whatever. It was a really big request. It was significant, substantial. And because of it was so big, you were nervous about the conversation, whatever that looked like. Maybe it was in... Um, you know, middle school when you wrote that note to someone, do you want to like me? Yes, no, with the boxes. Maybe it was something about a job or a promotion or a a, a meeting with a doctor or something like that. And and you had a conversation and you were really nervous about it because there was a lot going on there. I've been in some of those conversations. I've walked into some of them that had the potential to have major impact in my life. And in that conversation, I remember making a request only to have it rejected. And that's why we get nervous. Because there's a lot at stake. And depending on the answer, big, it makes a big difference in where your life goes from that. I remember, as I think about a big request, a big ask, I remember a Tuesday night in February of 1990. February, if you have to ask, it's February 27th, 1990. I remember it. I was heading to the student commons at college to make a big, big ask, a big request. See, Dana and I had been friends. We had gotten together for lunch Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but I had an event coming up. I was the the president of the student council or whatever they called it. So I had a banquet coming up and it was a formal event. It was a dress up event. And and most people were going to like bring a date to this event. So I thought, after about a month of this friendship, I thought it was the perfect moment to go from that friend zone into the maybe we could be more than friends zone. I don't know if that's exactly what it's called, but that's what was in my head. And so she was a cashier in the college bookstore, and I had used that to great advantage over the past month because I knew where she would be, and I knew she couldn't run away, so... You know, you get in line, you get, you get your turn. I get to have a turn having a conversation. So I bought a lot of certs during that month. I didn't have a lot of money, but I, you know, I could buy a breath mint. And so here I am marching over to the student commons, knowing that she's working in the bookstore that night. And I, I come up to the line. There were a few people in the store, and I kind of scoped them out to see if they were ready to buy their stuff or not yet. Because I it was nervous, you know? And, and as I go up, of course, as I go up to the thing, like two people get in line behind me. So I went, no, no, please go ahead. <laughs> and they did. They went in front of me. And so then after they were done, I asked if she wanted to go with me to that banquet. And if you've ever been in that moment, you know exactly what I was feeling. You've got that excited thing, but that nervous thing. You're expectant, you're hopeful, but you're unsure and and, you know, you kind of can't catch your balance and the room spins and time stops and birds sing and whatever. <laughs> I am excited this morning to invite you today to a big ask. To a, a request that you are invited to make that Jesus invited you to make a long time ago. We're going to talk about asking God to answer today. Now, in Christian circles, verses like this have been used, and I would say abused, to say that you can go and ask God for riches or for ease or for health or for comfort or for anything that you think makes your life better. Kind of like praying is a grand Christmas wish, where you go to God and and you hope that Christmas morning you get all the presents that were on your Christmas list. 
What I would say to you is that that's not what this is because that takes us in and makes what drives our prayers into one question, well, what do I want? That's not exactly what prayer is. Prayer is not about, well, what do I want? Something inside of us, if we're a believer, tells us that's not exactly what prayer is for. But because it's been abused, we back up from this. And I'm going to say to you today, let's not back up from this. Because Jesus very specifically and very on purpose says, we should be asking. We should be asking boldly, confidently, regularly asking God in prayer. In the end, what we find is that our desire for God to answer will be met. We may be surprised at the answer we get, and sometimes it's an answer we hadn't even considered. An answer we didn't even know that we needed. And when God comes through, it may have felt for a long time like God wasn't going to come through, only because God had a better answer than our question. Jesus has said a lot in the Sermon on the Mount, about how we relate to other people. You should tell them the truth. You shouldn't be unfaithful. You shouldn't be sexually immoral. You should care about the weak and the poor. And he said a lot about how we should relate to other people. But he's also said a lot about how we should relate to God. So I want to say this to you this morning. I don't have an x-ray, a spiritual x-ray, where I can see your soul and I can know your life or I can tell where your spiritual condition is, but the Holy Spirit is right here in this room, and He does know. And chances are, if you will listen to Him, He will show you. Maybe this morning, you are struggling to understand or to feel a relationship with God. Maybe you feel far away from God. Maybe you don't know what it's like to feel close to God. I would say you'd do well to listen to this today from Jesus. Go back and review the theme that Jesus repeats and brings to bear here in this passage about God as our Father, about how trustworthy He is, how good He is as our Father, how secure we are as His children, because God is our Father. In chapter 6, we had the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus starts it off with, Our Father who art in heaven. Jesus taught us how to pray. But here in this passage, Jesus basically says, pray. Pray. Make requests. Ask God for stuff. Talk to Him. Pour out your heart to Him. So if you feel stuck with God, this could be keeping you stuck. This could be the reason you're stuck. If you've felt far from God, this could be why. And listening to Jesus could be the exact right prescription for what will help you know what is true, that God is right here with you right now, that he is not far away, that he is close, and what Jesus says to do can help you know that. So we're going to read Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start off with just verses 7 and 8. And I hope this is familiar to you, but we're going to kind of dive into what Jesus is talking about here. And I'm going to kind of ask you as we talk about this to be open to Jesus' invitation. Not my invitation, Jesus' invitation today. It says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Jesus uses these words and he pours out something in our relationship with the Heavenly Father that is so full of promise, so dripping with potential, with invitation. And I wonder if we are stepping in the way Jesus asks us to step in. Do you hear how open his invitation is? And if you do, what you know is that prayer is such a powerful, incredible privilege, it causes you to pray with enthusiasm, with regularity, with connectedness. And if that doesn't describe your prayer life, then read again what Jesus just said. He says to us, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And then he goes back, in case you didn't hear it, and he basically repeats it all over again. 
Because to everyone who asks, it will be given. And to everyone who seeks, they will find. And to everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Wow. Isn't that amazing? And it's not because you earned the right for God to give you good stuff. That's not the point. The point is, you're invited to it. Because Jesus says, this is what we should be doing. So there's so much here for the church and there's so much here for each of us. So much more than we've probably been experiencing. If prayer has felt like a duty to you, oh, I didn't pray today. I forgot to pray today. Oh man, I should pray more. Then you miss the whole point of this. The point of this is, Listen, when you talk to God and you know who He is, then you know that when you ask, He answers. You know that He shows His goodness to those who love Him because He loves to. And so you are eager to dive into this. He uses these three words about making requests to God. All of these words are in the present tense. All of these words are about Do it now and keep on doing it. Do it continually and faithfully. He's not saying, like, once you ask, you will receive. He's talking about keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. And he's saying keep on doing it with the expectation, with the confidence that comes by faith that God's answer is sure, that God will do good, that God will do right, You are confident that God will come through because he says, ask and it will be given. So keep on doing it. Those words about what we are doing in prayer, asking, seeking, knocking. You notice that they are like more aggressive and more active. You start off by asking a question. It it turns into seeking, actively looking for stuff. And then it ends up at like knocking. You start off kind of clueless. I don't know what's going on. I'm just asking. But then seeking is kind of like, I have an idea of where this is going. I'm, I'm headed down. And then knocking is, I think I found the place I'm supposed to be and I need to get in. I'm knocking. It's this whole progressive thing. If you've ever prayed for something for a long time, you've gone through that progression, haven't you? You start off with God, this is a mess. I have no idea. And maybe the mess just blew up in your life and you didn't even know it was going to be. And here it is. And I'm, I'm just shocked and I'm taken back and I'm off balance. And then you start seeking. You start asking God for wisdom. And you start asking God to lead your steps. And you wind up at a place where it's like, here we are at the moment of decision and I'm knocking on the door. And each one of those things, you haven't crossed the finish line yet, but you've seen God progress you to a place where you're right at the threshold and God is about to answer. He invites us to persistent, enduring prayer that comes from the confidence that when we ask, we will be answered. When we seek, we will find. And when we knock, the door will be open. There is power in prayer. There is power in prayer because God answers prayer. The emphasis on the words here is the simplicity of our prayer. It isn't, you've made this wonderful long prayer. Sometimes people come and say, Pastor Mark, I don't know how to pray well. And my general answer to them is, just pray. Just because you think that there's some kind of like a grading scale. You're like in high school on prayer course or something. And the midterm is, can you pray long enough and hard enough and with big enough words in order for God to hear you? God doesn't care about that stuff. I don't know why we do. You know why I think we do? Because we'd like to feel proud of our prayers. You shouldn't feel proud of your prayers. You should feel grateful to your Father. Right? And so we come to God in prayer. Well, what is a good prayer? What kind of prayer is good enough to get God's attention? Well, according to Jesus, a good prayer is a prayer. I don't know if you got that. Let me back up. What is a prayer that measures up, that that God listens to? What is a prayer that is enough for God to hear and to change the heart of Almighty God, the Creator of the universe, the Savior? What is a prayer that's good enough? It's a prayer. Ask. Seek. Knock. Simple. It's just a prayer. The author of Hebrews compares us to children. 
We can boldly go into the presence of God. We can boldly go in to the presence of God. And Jesus invites us to believe that God is ready and eager to answer. Now, here's where I think we get from this wonderful, amazing privilege, which I'm kind of cheerleading for this morning, into this sense of heavy and duty and, ah, oh, I don't know if I can pray. Jesus says, when you pray, if you understand it right, you should pray with the mindset that God is ready and eager to answer your prayer. And so he says, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. And if you think that's too good to be true, maybe we misunderstood. Maybe that doesn't apply to me. Then Jesus comes back and says, for everyone who asks receives. And the other two words refer back to that. The one or everyone who seeks finds and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So let me ask you, who's included in everyone? I'll let you think about it. (laughs) Everyone who asks. Everyone who seeks. Everyone who knocks. The reason that you get discouraged in prayer is because you don't believe what Jesus said. Well, everybody else. Well, I don't know what's wrong with my prayer. My prayer's not getting to God. He's not answering me. I must, he must be mad at me. I must have been doing something wrong. Everyone. Now, I will say, to clarify this, it's not everyone in the world. Jesus is not talking to everyone in the world on this basis. He's been talking to people who are citizens of the kingdom. He's talking to people who are his children. The whole picture here, if it's everyone in the world, falls apart when God is not your father in the way that Jesus invites for you to have God as your father. So maybe you're here this morning and you're like, wow, that's cool. Everyone gets to ask and they will receive. Well, listen, if you're not a part of the family of God, then this isn't for you yet. It's an invitation because it can be for you too. There's no reason it can't be for you. But you need to come to the place where you accept what Jesus has done for you on the cross to make you a child of God, to forgive your sin, to make you born again. And you can do that by faith right now, and then you can be part of the everyone. But the idea here is believers who have become children of God are guaranteed by Jesus, guaranteed by Jesus, that God answers when we ask. Let that dig into your soul. I'm not... This is not me going, I hope God will answer. This is Jesus saying, if you're a child of God, if you're a citizen of the kingdom, when you ask, your father answers. So what's this all mean? It means, believers, we should pray like God will answer. We should pray because God will answer. I know, and I said this at the beginning, this can get twisted into selfishness. Ooh, great genie God, if I just pray, I can have anything that I want. Is it a guarantee that God's going to give you whatever you ask for? Well, I'll just throw you to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, James is the brother of Jesus. And he's also the first pastor at the church in Jerusalem, which is a story of itself because, you know, James is Jesus' little brother and little brothers don't always worship their older brothers when they grow up and all that stuff. And James hated his brother, while Jesus was here. And then after Jesus died and rose again, James became a believer. And now James is teaching the church. And one of the things he talks about is this idea of praying. And he says, he starts off with his brother's words and says, you don't have because you don't ask. Is it possible that some of the things in your life that you wish were different aren't different because you just haven't asked. You haven't asked expectantly. You haven't asked confidently. You haven't asked believing that God is your Father, that He will answer. You've asked nervously, or you've asked here and there. You've asked intermittently, but you haven't sought the Lord in it. You haven't acted like He's good. You've acted like you're trying to trick Him into it, or like God, you know, He might begrudgingly give you something nice. If you do something nice for you've acted like he isn't who he is. You can't make God into somebody he's not. And so if I go to God in prayer and I act like God doesn't really want to give me stuff, then I've taken the words of Jesus and I've said, no, Jesus, I don't believe any of that. 
James says, you don't have because you don't ask. So maybe there are some things in your life that are there because God wants you to spend some time believing how good He is. Oh, how He loves us. He will climb any mountain. He will knock down any wall. He will go any distance to find you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that when you're praying about the things in your life that are heavy and hard? Do you believe it then? Because that's what Jesus is saying. Put that together. You don't have because you don't ask. Then he goes on. The next verse, James says, But when you do ask, you don't receive because, why? You ask because it's just whatever you want. You ask like God isn't good enough that you should be in charge instead of Him. And so you ask for things that you shouldn't have, things that would be damaging, things that are selfish. He says, you ask and you don't receive because you ask wrong. You base your requests on human understanding, human desires, so God doesn't give you what you ask. And so what Jesus is saying here, coupled with what James says, it's not, this is a free-for-all. Ask to win the lottery. You know, if you don't like your spouse, ask for a new one. <laughs> this, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, you should ask like God wants to answer. I'm telling you, God is not inviting you. Jesus is not inviting you. And God is not in the business of making us self-centered, selfish children. If I'm a good dad and my kids go through the store and they're like, I want that and I want that and I want that. Am I a good dad if I just give them everything that they ask for all the time? Okay, kids, you have to tune out for a second. Parents, you can still answer this. Am I a good parent if I just give my kids whatever they want? Of course not. If I understand that in human parenting, how do I not understand that with God? If God is really good, He's not just going to give me whatever I want. That's not what Jesus is saying. What if I'm short-sighted? What if I'm blind? What if I'm selfish and I ask God for stuff? And it's like, oh man, the rules are you have to get whatever you ask for. I'm sorry. I'm No. God is so good, He's not saying you'll get whatever you ask for. What He's saying is, ask and trust in the goodness of God. Ask and expect. When, when we call out to God, God is not trying to act like He's going to smooth out every bump and bruise of life. We're so fragile and we're so delicate and short-sighted that we can't endure anything. He's not acting like that. What He's doing is inviting us in a conversation with our Creator and our Savior to ask for greater things. He's asking us to trust Him. He's asking us to know His love. And so really, here's what prayer is. Prayer is how we turn our lives over to God. When I go to God in prayer and I ask Him for stuff, I'm taking this burden, I'm taking this sense of lack, I'm taking this struggle or this stress, and I'm saying, God, here, now, I think this is what works and I'm giving it to you. I don't know what to do with all that. I can't do anything with that. And I'm giving it to you. We pray so that we can be ready to embrace whatever the good answer that God has for us is. That's why we pray. We can pray expectantly. We can pray excitedly. We can pray energized. Oh God, this is a problem but it's not too big for you. God, this is an issue, but I know you have an answer. And God, I know you'll answer in the right time, in the right way, in the right moment. And I can give you all my thoughts, but I thank you that you're going to do exactly what's right. That you don't need me to give you advice. So I can't wait to see what you do. Because I expect, I'm confident in your faithfulness, in your goodness. We sang this morning, you've never failed me yet. You're not going to start now. Prayer is that confidence, that faith that we take to God and we say, God, I know you will do what I ask or better. So here's what I'm saying, guys. You need to start making some big asks with God. Some big requests. Some God-sized requests. You need to stop watering down your prayer from like, 
okay, God, if it's not too much trouble, I know this is, you know, a lot to ask, but if you could just, like the word just that we use in prayer, if you could only, small, small, small. Your God is big, folks. And Jesus is saying to you, ask him for big stuff, big asks, things that you think that's impossible, that's beyond reason, that's beyond hope, but I've got news, nothing is too hard for him, nothing is too much for him to give you. Remember, God gave you his son. How would he hold back any good thing if he's already given you his son, how would he hold back anything good from you? So, ask for healing. Ask for the restoration of a relationship. If you're single and your heart yearns to be married, ask for a spouse. Ask for safety for your kids. Ask for purpose in your kid's life. Ask for a job. Ask for whatever. Big asks. Ask God for what you need, for what you want, for what you see. Ask Him for direction. You feeling lost? You feeling like you don't know which way to go? Ask God to show you. It amazes me how often we struggle with direction when God has said, ask and seek and knock and it will be open to you. When I get in this place and I talk with people a lot, they're like, I don't know what the right thing to do is. I'm scared I'm going to do the wrong thing. I go, listen, let's ask yourself some questions about what you believe about your heavenly father. Do you believe God knows the right answer? Everybody agree? We believe God knows the right answer. Yes. Do you believe God wants you to do the right thing? Okay. So, so far, we're, we're in pretty good shape. Do you believe God is able to show you what's right when you need to know? So why wouldn't He? Why wouldn't He? I'm not talking, oh, I think I might miss it. Do you think God's like, oh, I thought you would see that. Oh, man. Or do you think he knows how thick you really are? <laughs> right? Like, as a dad with my kids, we said this at the parenting conference. Sometimes I got to say things, I just take it in my, I got to say it a thousand times before you hear it, right? If I, as a human being, understand that about my kids, you think God doesn't understand that about me? Sometimes here's the thing. You're not actually looking for God's direction because you don't actually believe God is good. You don't trust him. You think you need to maneuver God into your plan because you think your plan's better than his. And that's where you get in trouble. And man, I'll tell you, there's a different feeling from waiting expectantly for God will show me and I'm going to keep walking forward, but I will know if it's not supposed to because God will show me and I'll know if it is supposed to because it'll just... Versus there are these obstacles that keep showing up in my way and I have to keep knocking them over and pushing through them and I'm exhausted from pushing them through all the stuff. You know what that is? God going, not this way, Mark. Not this way, Mark. Not this way, Mark. And at the end of it, I'm like, now, God, why was that so hard? He's like, because that was your plan. <laughs> Prayer is a way that we turn our lives over to God. And he says, come and ask big. Come and ask big. It doesn't mean God will do exactly what you ask, but God will do good. God will answer. And sometimes he's waiting to do big, good things for you to ask. That big need in your life is because you're so far away from God that you need to get close. By the way, it's not just big stuff. It's small asks too. Some of you are like, well, that's too small to ask God about. He's got better things to do than that. He's got more stuff to do, big things to worry about, keeping the moon in place and all that. Jesus doesn't say, ask him just big things like he's a big God. He's like, ask him small things like he's a personal God. Matter of fact, he just got done in chapter 6 talking about the birds of the field getting food and the grass of the field getting uh, clothing. Food and clothing, simple, small, regular, normal stuff. God is not too big to care about the needs of your life. So you have requests that you, may, you don't make no, be, known to him because you think it's too small. But Jesus says, ask, don't hold back ask. I'm saying to you, Jesus is inviting believers to ask. Then he goes on to kind of explain this a little further. So let me pick up at verse 9 and 10. It says this, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? 
I remind you, Jesus has used this picture of a father-son relationship a couple times. Last chapter, like I said, in the Lord's Prayer, he gives us the our father, giving God as the picture of our father. He comes back to that comparison again here. And I'm asking, what's he trying to get us to understand with this image of father and child? Here he's saying, we should ask God for what we need like a child asks his father. Don't misunderstand. He's not saying we're in charge no more than the boy who asks his father for bread or a fish is in charge. But what he's pointing to is that child has no hesitation asking his father for what he needs. Do you see that? There's the confidence he's inviting us to, the confidence that a son has in his good father. If you're a parent and your child comes to you and asks you something, You want them to know that they can ask you, don't you? You want them to have confidence that you care and that you are ready to answer what they need. When we ask, God gives. Maybe not exactly what we ask for, but what is good and what is eternally good. That's Jesus' point. He says, even human beings understand good. Even we are compelled to do what is good. This normal human experience of a father and child and asking for bread or asking for fish because I need some food and dad, you're the one who gives it to me. That's the normal understanding. If you're a parent, how heartbreaking would it be to think that your child needs something but doesn't think you care enough to give it to them? Think about that, parents. How heartbreaking would it be if your kids were like, you know, Dad, I know you don't want to give me any food and I know you don't care about me and I know, you know, but if you could just spare a little, like, wouldn't that break your heart if they really believed that? You want them to know that you love them, that you're doing good for them and even when you say no to them, you, you hope that they will get that you love them enough to say no, don't, right? And because of that, that's what Jesus is pointing to here. He says, listen, don't you think that God wants your good? If human parents understand it, don't you think your heavenly Father does? So he says, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Maybe a weird comparison. But do you remember that Jesus, when he was tempted in the, in the wilderness, Satan said, turn these stones into bread? What he's talking about is that there were stones that in the promised land, that looked a lot like the bread that they were making. They had similarities. And so here where the the son asks for bread, the picture is that the father gives him something that looks like bread, but isn't. It's like, ha ha, you thought you were going to get something, but I didn't care enough, and now I think it's funny that you suffer without what you need. I tricked you. Do you believe that God will trick you when you pray? Because Jesus is saying he won't. Do you believe that God is going to be tricky in your life? That he's going to disguise his will? That he's going to disguise his provision? That when you have a genuine need, he's not going to meet it, but he's going to fake you out like he did? Jesus says, why would you think that? You don't even think that about a human father. How often do we think that God answers prayer like this? The answer you thought was an answer only to find out it's another problem. Jesus says, don't think of God less than you would think of any decent parent. Don't you think God is at least a decent parent? Then he says, if he asks for a fish, will he give him a snake? In the second scenario, Jesus says God wouldn't answer a request from a child, a parent wouldn't answer a request from a child for nourishment by giving them something dangerous. And even if the snake was dead, it was an unclean animal, so it would have a a harmful, a, a bad effect on their child, making them ceremonially unclean. And they would have work to do to address the problem. They would be left in a worse position after asking and receiving from the Father than they were before. Do you think that you will ever be in a worse position with God when you ask Him for something and He answers? Do you ever think you'll be in a worse position? How often do we act like we are? Well, I don't know. I've been praying. I don't know. I've been asking and God just doesn't seem to answer. Wait a minute. Is God good? Do you believe that any decent parent would give a child what they need? 
then won't God? That's what he says. Don't think of God as less caring or less good than any normal, regular, decent parent. Expect that God will answer when we ask, that His answer will be good and not harmful. Expect that God loves to provide for His children, that He loves to answer our requests with good. Believers, believe this. It will change how close you feel to God. It will change how you pray. And in the last verse, Jesus brings that comparison to bear because then he says, verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Write that on your fridge. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Sometimes a good gift is discipline in your life. Sometimes a good gift is waiting, but believe this, it's good, because your father is good. How much, if you can understand that a parent sometimes needs to make hard decisions for the good of their children, how much more, Jesus says, how much more will your father in heaven, who is eternally good, incomprehensibly good, do good to those who ask him? How much more? Can you make the comparison? If it makes sense to you that a human parent would give good gifts to their children, and even if God were only just a normal human parent, you would expect Him to be reliably good and genuinely answer requests for need. But Jesus says God is not just a human parent. He is not just human good. He is eternally and entirely good. And so when we ask, how much more will God give good gifts to those who ask Him. Have you explored the generosity of God? Have you reveled in His goodness? Sometimes the thing I'm in right now makes it hard to know how good God is. So go back. Look at how good God has been. Look at what He's done for you. Look at how He showed up again and again. Remind yourself of His faithfulness in your life again and again. And then go to God and say, God, listen, I've tried to use this prayer thing as a way to show you how right I am, how good I am, how my plans will be good, but I'm done with that. Now I'm going to start believing that you're a good father and that when I ask, you will answer and I can ask you anything and I can know that you will answer good because you are good. And I'm going to come confidently asking because God will answer. It may be something you didn't expect. It may feel like a no when really it's a better yes. And remember, Jesus asked for something and didn't get it. Remember that? Father, if this cup could pass from me. But Jesus says, ask. Seek, knock. I'm wondering this morning if it's time for you to do exactly that. Have you been confident in your asking? So we're going to bow our heads. We're going to take a moment. I'm going to invite you to ask God for the things you should be asking Him for. Maybe you've asked Him before, but ask Him now. Ask Him with confidence. Ask Him believing. Ask Him trusting that He's a good God. Maybe it's a big ask or a small ask take it to him and believe that he gives good gifts live expectantly and excited to see what god does as you ask him so let's take just a minute and then i'll close this but let's take just a minute right here ask just like jesus says we need to